modern atomic theory is just the idea that all matter is composed of atoms. And it came out of some observations and laws. The law of conservation of mass, which we've talked about, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. So conversation, conversation. You could have a conversation about the law of mass. Hmm. The law of conservation of mass. In a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed, formulated by Antoine Lavoisier, 1700s. We've mentioned this before. When a chemical reaction occurs, the mass of, that you start with is the mass that you end up with. What's happening is the atoms get rearranged, but all the atoms that were present initially are still present at the end. And so just like Lego blocks, the mass is not going to change. Here we have some illustrations. If we take 7.7 .7 grams of sodium and mix it with 11.9 grams of chlorine, we're gonna get a total mass of reactants of 19.6 grams. These will undergo a chemical reaction in which they combine together to form sodium chloride. And the product has the same mass as what started out. Now we are gonna work on worksheet two this week also. And in worksheet two, there are a couple of problems that are referring to law of conservation of mass, multiple proportions, definite proportions. We have not in, in, um, introduced molar mass or the mole or atomic mass or anything like that. We haven't done stoichiometry. So those problems are not solved using stoichiometry. They're solved more like this, just very simple ideas. Question. Yes. So that's a good question. If you heat a bowl of water, uh -huh. you, know, you have a mass, say a gram of water, and you heat it so some of it evaporates, do you still have the same mass? That mass is still water, it's just not in your bowl. Okay. 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 So as it goes into the gas state, then it floats away right. because that's what gases do. And that's why Lavoisier burned things in a closed container. So if you had a closed container, like a bell jar or something, and you heated it and got some to evaporate, the, the container itself would still weigh the same amount. Yeah, good question. So understanding the law of conservation of mass, if I told you that I used 7.7 .7 grams of sodium and some chlorine to make 19.6 grams of sodium chloride, we should be able to figure out what mass of chlorine because it's the missing part of this. The sum of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products. And it's one of those things that's just so simple that it's hard. It's like, mind doesn't wanna deal with it. So, when a log uh, completely burns in a campfire, the mass of the ash is much less than the mass of the log. What happens to the matter that composed the log? We have three choices. The matter that composed the log reacts to form gases that are released into the air. The matter that composed the log is converted into energy. Or the matter is still present in the ashes but has a much lower mass. A. So the matter that was in the log still exists, but it turned into gases and those floated away, right? So what we have left in the you know, fire pit or whatever is going to weigh a lot less. So when we look at the law of conservation of mass, we have to control the environment so that we don't lose stuff, right? Because you can't see the gases and they just go off really, really quietly and you don't even notice it. So the law of definite proportions says that all samples of a given compound, regardless of their source or how they were prepared, have the same proportions of their constituent elements. And this was formulated in 1797. 
by Joseph Proust, a French. Um, yeah, there's a problem with the slide. I think it's supposed to be a French chemist or scientist. Oops. So water has the same ratio by mass of hydrogen and oxygen, no matter where you get it from. Whether you get it from a tap, you know, in Fresno, or you pull water out of the ocean. Now salt water is not pure water, right? It's got a lot of other stuff in it. So you have to take the other things out, but the water itself is the same as water here. Water from you know, river, like the Nile River, the water's the same stuff. So if we would take 18 grams of water and break it into its elements, we'd get 16 grams of oxygen and two grams of hydrogen. And so that gives us a ratio of oxygen to hydrogen of 16 to two or eight to one. So if you took any size sample and broke it into its constituent elements and looked at the ratio, water is always going to give you an eight to one ratio by mass. So the, the mass ratio of nitrogen to hydrogen in ammonia is 4.7 to one. If a sample of ammonia contains 10 grams of, of hydrogen, how many grams of nitrogen does it contain? Yes, 47. So the ratio is 4.7 grams of nitrogen to one gram of hydrogen. So if we have 10 grams of hydrogen how many grams of nitrogen? In order for this to be the same proportion, the one was multiplied by 10 to get this, so we take this and multiply by 10 to get that. So 47. Any questions? These are not problems that we really dwell on, but they illustrate important concepts. <laughs> Um, here's another one. Two samples of carbon monoxide are decomposed into their constituent elements. One sample produces 17.2 grams of oxygen and 12.9 grams of carbon. The other produces 10.5 grams of oxygen and 7.88 grams of carbon. Show that these results are consistent with the law of definite proportions. So the law of definite proportions says that the ratio of oxygen to carbon for each of these samples should be the same, right? So here we have oxygen and carbon for one sample. Here we have oxygen and carbon for another sample. So if we look at the ratio, 17.2 grams of oxygen over 12.9 grams of carbon. 17.2 divided by 12.9. I'm getting 1.33. Repeating. I'm just going to keep three sig figs. And that has no units because the units canceled out. Grams and grams. And then the other one was 10.5 grams of oxygen and 7.88 grams of carbon. And here my calculator is showing me 1.33248731. But again, three sig figs, we come up with exactly the same ratio. Any questions? That was definite proportions, multiple proportions. This is one of those things where when you say it in words, it sounds super, super confusing. When two elements, call them A and B, 
form two different compounds. The masses of element B that combine with one gram of element A can be expressed as a ratio of small whole numbers. And John Dalton came up with this one as well. Um, this is your book, uh, trying, trying to explain it a little better. Still not so great. What, what's happening is, you know, we can have a formula where there's one atom of A and one atom of B, or one atom of A and two atoms of B, one atom of A and three atoms of B, because they're individual particles. So basically what this comes down to is if you look at the ratio of oxygen to carbon in both substances, like we looked at for uh, constant composition, if you take the ratio of the ratios, you get a whole number, which is really kind of crazy. So carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, Two different compounds but both carbon and oxygen so um, if you have one gram of carbon you're going to get 2.67 grams of oxygen and you could do that like we did previous problem you just you know experimentally find it out so this is the ratio 2.67 to 1 in carbon monoxide it's 1.33 to 1 which we just calculated so if we take these ratios and take the bigger one and divide it by the smaller one, we get a whole number every time. And it's, it's just kind of, kind of weird unless you think about what's, what's actually happening here. This one has twice as many oxygens as this one does. And that's why we end up with two. So let's do a problem. Hydrogen and oxygen both form water and hydrogen peroxide. The decomposition of a sample of water forms 0.125 grams of hydrogen to every one gram of oxygen. The decomposition of a sample of hydrogen peroxide forms 0.0625 grams of hydrogen to every one gram of oxygen. Show that these results are consistent with the law of multiple proportions. So we've got our water. And that had a ratio of 0.125 grams hydrogen to one gram oxygen. And then we have our hydrogen peroxide. Can't spell tonight. And they tell us that's 0 0.0625 grams of hydrogen to one gram of oxygen. So the ratio for this one is 0 0.0625. That's you know, 0.0625 divided by one. And for this one, it's 0.125. This is the larger ratio. If we take that and divide it by the smaller, what do we get? We get two. And again, that's because water is H2O and hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. This one has twice as many oxygens. Um, but if we're looking at ratio of hydrogen to oxygen, this one has twice as many hydrogens per oxygen. Any question? So Dalton's atomic theory came out with this in 1808. Um, and these are the, the points of his theory. Each element is composed of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from the atoms of other elements. Atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. 
Atoms of one element cannot change into atoms of another element. In a chemical reaction, atoms only change the way that they are bound together with other atoms. So remember, a theory explains things that we observe. Right? So this is Dalton explaining stuff. Are all of these statements true? Not exactly. So this one, all atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties. Well, later we discover that there were different isotopes of the same element. But instead of throwing out the whole theory, it just needs to be adjusted a little bit. Atoms of one element cannot change into atoms of another element. That can happen in nuclear reactions. But in a chemical reaction, that does not happen. So now with things like scanning, tunneling, microscopy, the evidence for the existence of atoms is overwhelming. But back then, it was a big deal. <clears throat> 